Hello, everyone, wherever and whenever you're listening to this. My name is Elise Watson, and I'm thrilled to be here talking to you today. Uh, thank you very much to the Flemish Book Historical Society for inviting me to speak. Before I begin, I want to recognize that the work I will be talking about, carried out over COVID, would not have been possible without the additional work of librarians and archivists going above and beyond to help my research. And for that, I'm really grateful. Today, I'm going to talk about an intriguing bibliographical mystery that has frustrated scholars long before me. In 1905, C.P. Berger, librarian of the University of Amsterdam, described a baffling series of new acquisitions of the works of Klaas Brau, a 17th century Catholic printer, who seemed to be operating simultaneously in Harlem, Leuven, and Antwerp. Quote, this is a curious publisher who plays hide and seek with his publications, he wrote in understandable frustration. Quote, he regularly impersonates Leuven and Antwerp and calmly gives his Harlem address for both cities. Berger was not speaking lightly about the brazenness with which Brow arranged his imprints. His mise en page was seemingly unaffected by the location from which he was supposedly printing. From his imprints, you can clearly see the consistency of his printer's mark and the description of his shop. This was a transparent and obvious deception. Though Brow was a well-resourced printer, he certainly did not have three shops operating in three cities simultaneously, especially not on streets with the same name in each city. It seems absurd to think that this deception would have fooled anyone. What I will argue today is that false imprints like these, in which Dutch printers claimed that their works were printed in a Catholic city, contain multiple rich levels of meaning. While in some senses, false imprints were indeed a prudent business decision to avoid censorship from both reformed and Catholic authorities, what they actually represented was a confessional marketing strategy a brand of derivative and imitated Catholic piety that Northern Netherlandish booksellers used to make their books pious, orthodox, and appealing. Correspondingly, I want to frame my argument around these four reasons why a printer would want to use a false imprint. First, the complicated relationship between reformed and Catholic residents of the Dutch Republic required a polite fiction of adherence, which a false imprint could accomplish. Second, false imprints were one tool among many that printers used to navigate complex and intersecting systems of Catholic censorship. Third, false imprints conferred a sense of orthodoxy onto Catholic books, which helped them cross confessional borders and sell in international markets. Finally, the names of Orthodox Catholic cities like Antwerp and Cologne were themselves visual and aesthetic representations of a sense of Tridentine piety, which the false imprint impressed upon the text. The title of this paper, Derivative Piety, is also intended to evoke the theological concepts of imitation and derivation, familiar in the idea of imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. This was made famous by Thomas Akempi, but goes back to St. Augustine. Modeling their work on Christ himself, these printers and publishers employed this theological concept of imitatio into their publishing strategies. While both Catholic and non-Catholic printers used these imprints to avoid censure, through these imprints, Catholic printers in the Dutch Republic also strove to imitate the piety of their co-religionists in the Southern Netherlands. After a little bit of background on Catholics and Catholic printing in the Dutch Republic, establishing the ubiquity of false imprints, I will talk about these four reasons in turn. Ultimately, I want to argue that for both Catholic and non-Catholic printers of Catholic material, False imprints represented a confessional marketing strategy, an aesthetic brand of piety that was subtle enough to placate reformed and Catholic censors, but also advertised to potential buyers. 
First, I want to talk a bit about the terminology and why I am retaining the term false imprints. Descriptive bibliography has found various ways to describe the phenomenon in which the location stated in the imprint of a book differed from where it was actually printed. This comes in several forms. First, printers sometimes included imprints with the name of an obviously fictitious location. For example, this 18th century pamphlet against Voltaire claims that it was printed in hell with Beelzebub himself as master printer. Second, printers would sometimes use the names of others. This edition of Thomas Akempi's Imitation of Christ claims to be printed in Cologne by Balthazar of Egmond, but was in fact printed in Amsterdam by Jon Blau. Sometimes crafty printers invented new identities entirely. For centuries, printers across Europe utilized the identity Pierre Marteau, Peter Hammer, for the books they wanted to anonymize, even though such a person likely never existed. Finally, and this is most crucial for our purposes, printers would use their name and often even the precise location of their shop, but simply add a different city to the title page. This inevitably invites a whole host of questions. Is it unfair to lab label these imprints as false? Is it not within the realm of possibility that Brow had a shop in Leuven or that Blau simply commissioned books from Cologne? Can we not take at their word books whose imprints state that they were sold by or printed for these printers? Fortunately, archival sources often allow us to know the size of these printing enterprises with some confidence. As we will see, these publishers and printers were often forthright about these deceptions as well. As a result, I have decided to continue calling this, these misleading imprints false, even though I think that in many cases, they were not actually intended to deceive anyone. Catholics never stopped printing in the Dutch Republic. During the revolt in the Low Countries, the public exercise of Catholicism was first banned by the rebel government of Holland in 1573 and successively by every province. The States General finally outlawed it entirely in 1581. Rather than a principled stance by the new state, this was a practical measure to prevent Catholics from becoming the victims of further popular violence. Though Catholics were given the right to freedom of private belief with the Union of Utrecht in 1579, a series of successive decrees prescribed any kind of public Catholic practice in every city and province. However, numbers of extant Catholics were still substantial to the extent that scholars of Dutch Catholicism still dispute whether they can even be rightfully called a minority by this period. For this reason, they are sometimes labeled as a subculture or plurality rather than minority. By the broadest estimates, after 1648, active and passive Catholics made up at least half of the entire population. A large number of the nobility in the more rural provinces remained Catholic. And in cities, wealthy Catholics wielded substantial economic and political power. Even so, Catholics were not allowed to hold public office or become citizens, though some managed to do so anyway. They were also forced to pay large bribes to their local sheriff to worship in semi-concealed house churches. In urban areas, these developed into ostentatious and elaborate sanctuaries capable of accommodating organs, choirs, and rich decorations imported from the Southern Netherlands. While their readers were disenfranchised politically, Catholic books made up a substantial and flourishing proportion of the book trade, especially in cities. Printers flooded the market with Catholic almanacs, devotional prints, and school books. Liturgical calendars and decrees from the Dutch mission were hung up in shared religious spaces. Booksellers imported Catholic texts from the Southern Netherlands, as well as from other 17th century centers of Catholic print, like Paris and Cologne. A bookseller could easily establish an entire profitable career dealing only in Catholic books. For example, one Amsterdam printer and bookseller 
dealt so extensively in Catholic books that his 1681 stock catalog includes a separate section for non-Catholic theology. The libraries of Catholic priests were unreservedly sold at public auction and advertised in newspapers. False imprints were also ubiquitous among all confessions. Heterodox religious material, incendiary political pamphlets, and books with targeted export markets were almost always concealed with the often unconvincing veneer of a false imprint. In 1725, one Dutch news editor scoffed at a recent prohibition of fictitious imprints in France, writing, quote, if one were to publish such an ordinance here, the entire Calverstraat would erupt in laughter. A substantial amount of Catholic jobbing print kept these printers afloat that is only beginning to be described by historians. There were dozens of different kinds of Catholic ephemera. In my research, I have found and documented 21 different kinds of ephemeral print produced specifically by and for Catholics in the Dutch Republic, a few of which are depicted here. Though most of these by nature do not contain any information about the printer, this kind of confessional print, barely recognized by modern scholarship, would have been ubiquitous in the lives of clergy and laity alike. This proliferation of Catholic print, understandably, did not thrill reformed consistories and city councils. From a reformed perspective, Catholic books had been implicitly prohibited since 1581. A decree from the States General banned offensive, seditious, and scandalous print, while simultaneously clarifying that continued adherence to Rome or to governance by the Habsburgs constituted offensive, sedition, and scandal. This awkward wording meant that Catholic print was not prohibited by name, but entirely by implication. Implementation depended solely upon whether Catholic books were seen as part of public Catholic worship, which was banned, or part of pri private Catholic belief, which was permitted. There are a few examples of Catholic print being banned throughout the 17th century. For example, Petrus van den Bosse's The Catholic Pedagogue, banned as an educational book, or political pamphlets like the Holland Apocalypse by Jesuit Carolus Scribanus, which attacked the states of Holland directly for their anti-Catholicism. However, these are comparatively rare. Printing Catholic books seems to have been done fairly openly and brazenly. The prolific Jesuit Francis Coster even produced a translation of the Bible with a dedication to the states general defending the reading of scripture and the Catholic faith and asking them not to ban the book. Consistories and city councils were especially bothered by the printing of rich liturgical books in Amsterdam, even by non-Catholic printers like Jan Blau. In 1626, the reformed consistory in the city communicated their displeasure to the city council about, quote, the glory of the papists abroad that such books are being printed in Amsterdam, even if this fact was concealed by a false Cologne imprint. In 1638, humanist scholar Gerardus Vossius wrote to fellow scholar Hugo Crotius that Blau, quote, more keen on his own interest than on the common good, more yearning for money than honor, only thinks of gaining profit. He says that nothing is more profitable for him than his geographical maps, but he could have added the mass books, which he printed, but with the name of a printer from Cologne on the title page. While these ostentatious print runs irritated the consistory and the city council, in general, very little was done to oppose the book trade of the papists. As the classes of Amsterdam wrote in a resolution to its ministers in 1639, their best strategy was to, quote, preach against popery, disprove thoroughly its principal arguments, refute completely its circulated books, visit households often, and if possible, confront the priests, or at least the papists. Though the records of the Synod of Helderland mention their unease with the printing of Sicinian works and remonstrant Bibles in the 1650s, Catholic print is never mentioned as a concern. Though hardline censorship needed to happen occasionally, 
The path of least resistance was to exist in tension with the Catholics in their community. Obscuring the place of publication was therefore a polite nod to the infrequently enforced ban on offensive print in the Dutch Republic. Benjamin Kaplan has written extensively about the fictions of privacy that allowed reformed and Catholic neighbors to live side by side in the Dutch Republic. The practice of everyday ecumenism, as Willem Freyhoff has defined it, required people of different confessions to grit their teeth and coexist in shared spaces, pretending that their faith was only something to find in private. These false imprints allowed everyone to maintain a collective falsehood, a polite fiction that these books were not being printed in their communities, and that they were coming from heathen lands as far off as their neighbor to the south instead. Somewhat counterintuitively, Catholic censorship of Catholic books in the Dutch Republic was much more severe than reformed censorship of Catholic books. The Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith offered individual dispensations to read prohibited books to each successive leader of the Dutch mission called the Vicar Apostolic. In January, 1633, the Harlem Cathedral chapter warned Catholic printers that they could not print without diocesan approbation. Even books with multiple approbations published by high ranking ecclesiastical officials were banned and put on the index. When Vicar Apostolic Johannes von Neercastle published his final work of theology entitled Penitent Love under a false imprint in 1683, it contained approbations from censors in Mechelen, Brussels, Antwerp, and Liège, but the work was still placed on the index in 1690 under suspicion of Jansenism. However, some false imprints were institutionally supported. Many of Jan Blau's Catholic texts also bear the imprimatur of Henricus Sirstorfius, a censor in Cologne. However, many, if not all of these, were in fact dispensed by the Vicar General of the Dutch Mission, Leonardus Marius, in Amsterdam. According to extant correspondence, Marius was granted the power to act as censor in Sirstorfius's stead. As Blau's Jesuit editor wrote to the papal nuncio in Cologne in a letter of 16th July, 1642, quote, it is necessary for the approval of censoring books that Marius has the power to be appointed in the name of Sirstorfius. Similarly, in an audit of the catechisms used in schools in the Northern Netherlands, carried out around 1700 and implemented by members of the mission, obviously fake imprints are repeated in internal documents. This is even when they are in the same hand and on the same page. While Frederick van Maetelen was well known as a printer and bookseller in Amsterdam and printed a large amount of official material for the mission, the imprints are listed as they appeared on the title page, even if this meant ascribing multiple cities to a printer on the same sheet. Non-Catholic printers also undertook significant effort to ensure that their Catholic books had the appropriate permissions. Members of the Blau, Elsevier, and Jansonius firms even traveled to Rome in the 1640s and 50s. This was in order to obtain imprimaturs and expurgations for their pre-publication manuscripts of Catholic books. They were amazingly welcomed and successfully cultivated commercial relationships with the Holy Office. Contemporary understandings of censorship make it hardly conceivable that reformed publishers from Amsterdam would travel to Rome to submit a book for pre-publication censorship. However, this is exactly what happened. In the 1660s, Johannes Jansonius visited Rome with copies he intended for sale, as well as pre-publication manuscripts of other materials he intended for a Catholic audience. The most famous of these uh, was his publication of Jesuit Athanasius Kircher's Mundus Subterraneus. His efforts were so well received and censors there even carried out a rare expurgation so that the famous Amsterdam printer, as they called him, could sell one of the books without concerns for heresy. 
Even so, many of these books from these famous Amsterdam printers still ended up with other cities of publication on their title pages. These false imprints also helped to confer orthodoxy to the book. Amsterdam and Northern Netherlandish imprints were viewed with suspicion in foreign markets. In 1621, the Bishop of Antwerp issued an ordinance that compelled all teachers, printers, and booksellers to submit their teaching materials to a new evaluation process. This regulated the price, quality, and type of paper used to print these books, as well as an appraisal of the content and correction of anything objectionable. Most importantly, this new ordinance also banned all school books that were printed in the Dutch Republic. Dutch imprints could also hold up books at the French border. Imprints from Protestant cities were seen in Rome as unseemly and scandalous, even for ostensibly Orthodox Catholic books with approbations. Books written for an audience of Catholics in the Northern Netherlands, like the devotional text Jacob's Ladder, published in 1666, were also placed under suspicion by the Holy Office and investigated for theologically objectionable content based solely on their publishing location. Even books by priests and high-ranking members of the Dutch mission were under suspicion simply because they had been printed there. Even when not sanctioned by the Holy Office, false imprints helped Catholic books printed in the Dutch Republic reach their export destinations with lessened scrutiny. The Amsterdam printer Jacob von Meers obtained a travel journal from Jan Neuhoff, who had traveled in China working for the Dutch East India Company. Seeing a valuable opportunity, von Meers obtained a 15-year privilege from the States of Holland to print the book. He produced French, Latin, German, and English editions in the 1660s. A curious new edition emerged in 1666, bearing the imprint of an Antwerp publisher who printed mostly for the Jesuit order. This almost certainly was still printed by von Meers. However, the Antwerp imprint and the name of a prominent Catholic printer provided confessional plausibility and a sense of orthodoxy to this edition. This was both a strategy to avoid censorship and to market the book to Catholics who would have trusted an Antwerp imprint far more than an Amsterdam one. The text was even modified to ensure its Catholic orthodoxy. As the introduction clarifies, the writer consulted many Catholic priests in the creation of this edition. Here, false imprints and censorship were both employed for profit. The Amsterdam printer Cornelis Cole also printed a large amount of educational books like catechisms and sermon books under a Loven imprint, using and reusing the same simple devotional woodcuts. His frequent employment of Loven was likely intended to evoke both a sense of theological orthodoxy, but also education, as Loven was the major center of Catholic education in the Southern Netherlands. Printers worked hard to connect their books with their destination market. The Jesuit Francis de Smith's Daily Meditations for the Whole Year was printed in 1683 under an Antwerp imprint. The title page advertises that it was printed with the privilege of the king, while the back matter contains approbations both from the Jesuit censor for Flanders and the canon of Antwerp. It is dedicated as well to the steward general of the city of Antwerp. Such strong features of piety and civic pride present in the paratext could have worked both as a tool to market this book to a Dutch audience as orthodox and help it sell in Antwerp markets as well. However, if you're observant, you may have already noticed the familiar printer's device from my first slide on, the, on this title page. Indeed, three separate issues of this text appeared in 1683 with type all cast from the same matrix. The only thing modified was the imprint, triply attributed to Amsterdam printers and booksellers Johannes Stichter and Frederick van Metelen, as well as our own Brow, from whose press this edition almost certainly originated. This is yet another kind of deception utilized for profit. As these examples demonstrate, 
false imprints helped market Catholic books and avoid any suspicion of unorthodoxy. Whether the publishers were Catholic or reformed, obscuring the place of publication and sometimes their own names was a business strategy targeted towards successfully accessing and appealing to export markets. Finally, Catholic printers in the Dutch Republic employed false imprints as an, as, as an aesthetic and stylistic choice. For a minority Catholic, buying a book with Antwerp or Cologne printed on the title page called to mind the elaborately stylized liturgical books they saw for sale from these Catholic cities in their communities. These books circulated in the Dutch market alongside those actually printed in the Southern Netherlands. Dutch booksellers imported enormous quantities of books from sources like the Plantin Moretus and Verdussen fir firms in Antwerp. The Plantin Moretus firm was the undisputed head of this trade. Between 1579 and 1671, at least 156 Northern booksellers imported books from the Officina Plantiniana, as stated in the ledgers of foreign customers of the Officina. This map represents the distribution of these buyers in the Dutch Republic. The province of Holland and Amsterdam in particular, unsurprisingly made up the majority of this trade. One Amsterdam bookseller, Hendrik Behrens Hartogveld, ordered a staggering total of 51,500 guilders worth of books from the Officina between 1619 and 1645. Some, like the Utrecht bookseller Jan van Dorn, even used other Antwerp firms as proxies to get better access to their supply. By the end of the 17th century, these imports to the Northern Netherlands were largely made up of liturgical books. As Amsterdam's status of, as bookshop of the world began to establish itself even more firmly in the 17th century, printers began to produce their own liturgical books with false imprints. Though the printing of the, the Directorium of the Diocese of Harlem, an important liturgical book, had historically taken place in Antwerp, an Amsterdam printer took over its printing in 1681. However, he began printing it from the start with a Cologne imprint before switching to Antwerp a few years later. Jon Blau's missals and breviaries contain Cologne imprints as well. The layout of these books was specifically intended to emulate Tridentine and Southern Netherlandish designs. The Amsterdam Catholic printer Johannes Stichter's 1685 Antiphonarium Romanum, a large format liturgical book intended for use by the choir, relied strongly on the engraved title page designs popular among Antwerp publishers like the Moretuses and Verdussens. The prominent placing of Antwerp in the colophon was no less a part of the overall visual effect of the title page than the Christogram IHS or the engraved plate itself. Similarly, this history of the Augustinian order was printed in Amsterdam in 1683. The engraved title page demonstrates various aspects of its Catholicity, the greeting of the Virgin as Star of the Sea, Ave Maristella, as well as the presence of Netherlandish patrons, Saints Willebrard and Boniface. Part of this brand of pious orthodoxy was, too, the false Cologne imprint alongside the name of the Amsterdam printer. These labels communicated right faith both to interested buyers and the ever watchful eyes of ecclesiastical censors in their own confession. Combined with the richly engraved title pages, that characterized the liturgical books of the period. The connection with design from firms like the Plantin Moretus was unmistakable. In this way, the false imprints themselves evoked a sense of Tridentine piety. As I hope I have demonstrated, the ubiquitous use of false imprints in Dutch printing and Dutch Catholic printing in particular could serve many ends. They could be employed to elide censorship but also to make books attractive and enticing to foreign markets with strategical confessional branding. While false imprints maintained a polite fiction of adherence with reformed authorities, they were also implemented to address very real concerns within the world of Catholic censorship. They also conferred a sense of orthodoxy on Catholic books, 
helping them cross borders. Finally, the names of cities like Antwerp and Cologne within the mise en page of the title page itself represented piety. It is true that much work remains to add to these conclusions with the modern bibliographical tools available to us. In future non-COVID times, methods like typographical analysis and more detailed archival research will be able to paint a fuller quantitative picture of how many of these false imprints there are and how many have been ignored or miscatalogued due to their ambiguous nature. However, as I have worked on my doctoral project from my desk in St. Andrews, unable to do this book in hand research and instead looking at these at scans and pictures on my screen, it has struck me how many layers of meaning these books contain in their imprints, paratexts, and preliminaries. While Brown may have been, as C.P. Berger put it, playing hide and seek with his imprints, he was doing much more. With these false place names, he was making a statement about his intention and audience, coexisting with his reformed neighbors and expressing solidarity with his fellow Catholics across the continent. Thank you.